Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for SAT. We have been solving SAT math problems out of this book here, the SAT Official Study Guide 2020. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today I will solve some problem that you will find on page number 738. Please turn to it. Page 738. Always make sure the book is in front of you. If at the end of the video you find this helpful and you decide that you would like to work with me, you can get hold of me by sending me an email at kishwaniprep at icloud.com. Let's take a look at number 13. As you can see on that page, it begins with number 12. We'll take care of number 12 in a second. Let's take a, number, let's take a look at number 13 first. In number 13, we are simply being asked to pick a statement which statement it says is not true. So we have, our job is to pick a statement among these four that is not true. And these are the four statements. Before we look at the four statements, let's see what, what it is that is. Let's see what it is that is given to us in the graph. So here's what the graph, here's what the graph looks like. So it goes all the way up to eight. 2, 4, 6, and 8. And it goes here we have the time in minutes and goes all the way to 30. So 10, 20, 30. Again, obviously the book is for front of you, so you can take a follow the graph as I do it. I have to put the graph on the blackboard, otherwise, we will not be able to answer this question. So if you look at the graph, you will see that in the first five minutes. In the first five minutes, the speed goes all the way from 0 to 7. So here's 10, so which is, this is 5. This is 6, this is 8, 7 is right here. In the first five minutes, we see that the speed goes from 0 to 7. Then from 5 to 10 minutes, for the next five minutes, for the next five minutes, from 5 to 10 minutes, we see that this, our speed is constant. Then the, for, the, for the next 10 minutes, for the following 10 minutes, between 10 and 20 minutes, between 10 and 20 minutes, we see that her speed falls from 7, seven miles per hour. This is miles per hour. From 7 miles per hour, it falls down to 5 miles per hour. And again, if you follow the graph, you'll, you'll be fine. Here's 5. For the next 10 minutes, it falls. And then it rises again. For the next following five minutes, it goes from five miles per hour all the way up to eight miles per hour. So here's our eight, and here's 20, here's 30. For the next five minutes, it rises, and then it falls all the way to zero in the last five minutes. This is what the graph is, looks like now that we have the graph in front of us. We can figure out which four of these statements does not make any sense. So here we go. For the first five minutes, the speed rises from zero to seven. For the following five minutes, it stays constant. Then it falls for the next 10 minutes. Then it rises again for the next five minutes. And then finally it falls in the last five minutes. Let's look at statement one. The statement A says that, the, that she ran at a constant rate for five minutes. And that is in fact true. She ran at a constant rate right here between five and ten minutes. During this period, her speed, are her speed is constant. Once, it, once she reaches seven miles per hour, she maintains that speed until the end of the tenth minute. For the next five minutes, she runs at a constant rate. That statement is true. The statement C, for some strange reason, it goes from A to C. I, I wonder why. The statement C says that the speed goes down for the last five minutes at a constant rate, which is also true. As you can see, it's a linear graph, the slope is constant. If the slope is a linear graph, the slope is constant, which means it's falling at a constant rate. In the last five minutes, the speed goes down all the way from 8 to 0. That statement is also true. The statement D says that she manages to attain the maximum speed, she attains the maximum speed in the last 10 minutes. Her maximum speed is attained right here. She achieves maximum speed. It turns out, it seems that she attains a maximum speed at the end of 25th minute, hence the beginning of the 26th minute. 
she has the maximum speed of 8 miles per hour so to say that her maximum speed was attained within the last 10 minutes that is true between the minutes of 20 and 30 that's where she attains the maximum speed that statement also true let's look at statement B let's see what's going on in statement B in statement B it says the speed was increasing for a longer period it says the speed was increasing at a longer period of time than it was decreasing let's see for how long of a period it was increasing and for how long of a period it was decreasing so let's first look at the period where the speed is increasing and then we look at the period where the speed is decreasing the speed is increasing here in two periods the speed are increasing only in two periods right here from 0 to 5 from 0 to 5 and then it goes then it stays constant then it goes down and then it increases again in this period from 20 to 25 from 20 to 25 those were the only two periods where, where speed is increasing that's a, that's a period of 10 minutes when we talk about this, a decreasing part where is the discrete, uh, speed decreasing from 10 to 20 minutes from 10 to 20 minutes that's, that alone is already 10 minutes and it decreases again in the last 5 minutes 20, from 25 to 30 from 25 to 30 it decreases again so it decreases for a period of 10 minutes and it decreases for a period of 5 minutes it decreases for a total of 15 minutes and therefore to claim that her, her speed is increasing for a longer period then it was decreasing that is not true her speed is increasing only for 10 minutes and her speed was decreasing for a period of 15 minutes the claim that is made in statement B is not true, it's not valid which is just as well because we were running out of options the answer is B now that number 13 is out of the way let's take a look at number 12 Number 12, we are told that the price of certain item and a 6%, 6 of price, which is the tax on the item, it turns out that it's altogether is $53. The question simply is, what's the price? So let's find out, shall we? Price plus a 6%, which is, which is simply going to be 1.06 times P, has to equal 53. And therefore, P has to equal 53 divided by this amount. One, one point zero six p equals fifty three, and therefore p is equal to fifty three over one point zero six. Let's somehow get rid of this one point zero six business. Let's multiply top and bottom by one hundred. And if you multiply top and bottom by one hundred, if you multiply top and bottom by one hundred, fifty three times one hundred on the top, we'll just write it like that. And at the bottom what we end up is 1.06 times 100 is 106 which was the whole point we wanted to get rid of the decimal. Let's divide top and bottom by 2. We divide top and bottom by 2. 100 divided by 2 is 50 and 106 divided by 2 is 53. Oh how nicely it works out you see. Here we have 53, here we have 53. Let's divide top and bottom by 53 and it turns out that the price is $50. Price is $50 and that's answer choice B. Let's look at number 14. Number 14. Number 14 is a geometry question. Let's see what it has to say. Let me grab a better, better uh, piece of paper to erase my blackboard. Number 14. You done with this thing? And we're also done with this thing, obviously. Number 14, it says that we have a quadrilateral. That looks something like this. This we are told is 45, this is x degrees, this is x degrees, this is x degrees. The question simply is, What's the value of x? What we need to understand here is that is, is, is that the sum, the sum sum of angles in in any quadrilateral quadrilateral 
is 360 degree equals 360 degree. The question is why? Why does the sum of the angles in any quadrilateral have to be 360 degree? Well, the answer is very simple. Because, because, answer is very simple because a quadrilateral is simply a quadrilateral is simply a union of two triangles. A quadrilateral, nothing, a four-sided picture, regardless of how it looks like, any four-sided picture is basically a marriage of two triangles. You can either, you can, you can either go this way or we can either go this way, doesn't matter. For example, here, we'll do it. there we go. It's two triangles, and so, since we know that the measure of measure of triangle in measure of angles in one triangle is 180, and measure of angles in this triangle is 180, and therefore the measure of triangles in a quadrilateral is simply 180 times 2 or 360. And that's all we need to understand. So again, one more time, the sum of the angles in any quadrilateral is 360. So there we go. So here we have x plus x plus x plus 3x plus 45. 3x plus 45 would have to be 360 and that implies that 3x would have to be would have to be 360 minus 45 that's 315 and that in turn implies that x would have to be let's divide let's divide top and bottom let's divide both sides of the both sides of the uh, equation by 3 this 3 is going to drop out this 3 has 1 3 this one has no 3 is 2 0 too small to have any threes. That one goes and joins the fives and becomes a fifteen. And fifteen has how many threes? Five threes. There you go. The answer is x is equal to one o five. Let's do number fifteen, shall we? Number fifteen says that. We have a stack of 50 coins, a stack of 50 coins is 3 and 7 inch, 7 inch tall. The question is, we have, what question is the stack that is 8 inches tall has how many coins? has approximately how many coins given the fact given the fact that uh, if you have a stack of 50 coins that will be 3, 7, three and 7 8 inch tall well if I had a if I told you that I have a stack of coins same coin obviously same same de same denomination same denomination coin in this in this in this problem it happens to be a penny so if I put pennies on top of each other and I tell you that this stack is 8 inches tall would you be able to tell me approximately how many pennies I have in that stack? Well, the answer is yes, of course because we're looking for approximate answer it's a stack that is 8 inches tall is approximately how many coins? Well, we know that uh, that 4 inches see this is, this is a, because we're looking for approximate answer the stack of 50 coins is 3 and 7 8, coin, 7, 8 inches tall which is approximately 4 inches which is approximately 4 inches. So if 4 inches has 50 coins, if 4 inches has 50 coins, then obviously 8 inches is going to have 100 coins. There's nothing to do here. The answer is 100. 8 inch tall would have 100 coins because we were told that one that is approximately 4 inches tall has 50 coins. Well, if 4 inches has 50 coins, it stands to reason that the stack that is twice as tall would have twice as many coins. Number 16. Number 16, we are told that A minus B is equal to 12, and we are further told that B over 2 is equal to 10. Question simply is how much is A plus B? Let's see what we can do, right? These are two very simple equations, obviously, they are too silly actually. Let's solve for B here. B is equal to 20 from here. Let's put it in here. 
So we have a minus 20 is equal to 12. Bring the 20 to the other side, which means a is equal to 32. a is equal to 32, b is equal to 20. And therefore, a plus b is simply going to be 52. And that is answer choice D. I'm going to stop giving you answer choices. You can see bloody well what the answer choices is yourself. Number 17. In number 17, we are told that y is equal to 20 plus $1.50 times x. So what's going on here is that we're going to rent a moving truck. A uh, lot of moving uh, moving truck services that, that are there, like a U-Haul or something. And usually when we go there, they have a flat rate that you have to pay just to get the just to just to just to get the truck. And after that, you pay a certain amount per mile. And that's exactly what's going on here. The question here is, what is the interpretation of this y-intercept? But the answer is very simple. The interpretation of this y-intercept is that this twenty dollar is a flat fee. You have to pay. A fee. We have to pay a flat fee of $20 just to get the truck off the off the parking lot. And then after that, after that, as we start driving, we have to pay $1.50, $1.50 per mile. So the answer to the question is what is the interpretation of the of the interpretation? What is, what is the interpretation of intercept? And the answer is it is the flat fee. Flat fee of $20. And that was number 17. Let's do number 18. Number 18, we have a scatter plot. But before we worry about the scatter plot, let me first write down the question, because having this question written out on the blackboard would help us, because it is the wording that might throw off some people. So let's let's, let's take our time. Let's take our time and see what it, see exactly what is what is being asked. What is what it is that is being asked? It says for charity, or not for our charity, rather for the charity. We're looking for we're looking for one particular ch charity for the charity with the greatest percentage of total expense sp spent on programs. What is the approximate difference between what is the approximate difference between the actual percentage minus the predicted percentage? So there is a certain percentage that is going to be predicted by our scatter plot by when we fit the, the best in the, the line, the best fit line. And based on that line, the best fit line in the scatter plot is going to give a certain per a prediction. The question is how does it compare to what, what the actual percentage was of their expenses? What percentage of the total intake that they have, the donation that they collected, did they spend on the actual programs, programs, whatever programs they're running, as opposed to spending on rent or paying the salary for the executive or paying for fancy cars that, that they might drive. What percentage of the expenses? Some charities, they spend only about half of what you give them on actual programs. The other half just disappears on other things. Some charities, they spend as much as 70, 80, 90 percent of the donation that they collect on, on the actual program. So let's look at a chart. There's not much room. I'll do my best here. You have the book in front of you. So here we go. So it begins at 70, let's, see, let's say this is 80, this is 90, and we're going to go, we're going to have to go up to 95, so let's say this is 95. And then it goes up to 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. Again, if you have the book in front of you, which I'm sure you do, if you look at the book carefully, you, yes, we just have to put the scatter plot, the, the fitted line, and in order to put the faded line on, on the blackboard, or any line for that matter, a straight line that is, we only need two points. So I'm going to give you two points. You can pick up the two points yourself just by looking at the line. The two points that I, cho that I chose was, this is one, so at half, at half and 80. There you go, that's, that's where I found 
half and 80. This is half and 80. You know, I'm taking too long here. Half and 80. And the other point was the other extreme here. I have a little bit after 3, a little bit after 3, and 85. Or rather, I'm not going to write the numbers, this is half and 3, and the other point I found was the other extreme at 6 and 90. There is 90, and there is 6. There we go. This is the fitted line. This is the fitted line, and now I'm going to show you, and again, if you look at the graph yourself, you will see that we are trying to look at one charity that spent the greatest percentage on the program. And since we are measuring the percentage here on y-axis, we're looking at one point that, that is highest. And the one point that is highest, you will see that that appears to be a little bit after 3, just a little bit after 3. And it appears, it appears somewhere between 90 and 95. It appears somewhere between 90 and 95. That's the, that's the charity that spent the greatest percentage of the program. And because it appears between 90 and 95 and there is no way to tell exactly what it is, let's just say about 92 or 93. 92 or 93. That is the, that is the percentage that they actually spent on the program. Or well, what is the predicted percentage of their expenditure according to the fitted line? But well, the predicted percentage is right here. And that if you look at it, if you look at uh, again chart one more time, you will see that it is 85%. This is 85%. That's it, we're done. This is the predicted part, this is the actual part. So actual actual is either 92 or 93, either 92 or 93, it's up to you, minus minus the act predicted, predicted part, which is 85%. So it's about 7 or 8%. It's about approximately 7 or 8%. Just pick one answer choice that comes closest to it, 7 or 8 percent, and the only answer choice that makes sense there is B. B says 7 percent because the others are 10, 4, and 1. That's the end of that page. That's the end of that page. We're not going to start a new page. I'll meet you again tomorrow, and we'll pick up from where we left off. If you need to get hold of me, you can reach me at kashwaniprep at icloud.com. Just send me an email. Alright? Bye now.